in a little town in central Minnesota known as New Elm, you will see on a hill a huge statue. It's of a man holding a sword and wearing a winged helmet, and you might think it's a Viking. But New Elm is a strongly Germanic community, and this figure is actually Herman the Liberator, or Arminius the Liberator, if you like the Latinized form of his name. In the forests of northern Germany, in 9 AD, a tremendous and decisive battle took place. In the Battle of Tudorburg Forest, this Germanic chieftain, Herman the Liberator, defeated General Varus and decimated three Roman legions, driving the Romans back across the Rhine River. Augustus never really got over this. Repeatedly, he would be heard saying, Varus, Varus, give me back my legions. But the practical effect of Hermann's victory was that northern Germany and Scandinavia beyond it was forever free of the influence of Roman law and as a result continued the old Teutonic Anglo-Saxon common law instead. Some of the German people, the Visigoths in southwestern Europe and the Ostrogoths in southeastern Europe and others adopted forms of Roman law. If you look to the Visigothic Code, it is not very different from the Roman law itself, but the common law of northern Germany, the Anglo-Saxon law as we call it, and of Scandinavia is far different. And we're going to see that difference as we look to the rise of the common law. There is said to have been a great migration of Indo-European people from Central Asia into Eastern Europe and then further on into Western Europe, a migration that began somewhere around 2000 BC and that I would suggest may have been a further disbursement after the flood. Two of these groups that migrated into Western Europe were the Celtic people and the Anglo-Saxon people. They shared certain characteristics in common with most Indo-European people. They tended to be more monotheistic, though not entirely so. They were less inclined toward emperor worship. They practiced decentralized government in which power came from the bottom up, not from the top down, and a system in which the individual was valued above the group. The Celtic people, which at one time lived in much of Germany and most of France and Spain, as well as the British Isles, would probably be characterized as more artistic, more literary, more musical, philosophical, agrarian, somewhat laid back, you might say. The Germanic people tended to be more organized, more businesslike, more disciplined. They seem to have a genius for organization. It was a very decentralized form of organization, but one that functioned very effectively nevertheless. And we're going to find that Celtic law and Anglo-Saxon law both have a strong influence on the common law of England and of America. When we speak about common law, might be good to define that term. I remember I used to hear that term used occasionally in law school, very seldom, I'm afraid. Never did I hear it defined, and I had a rough idea what it was, but a very rough idea. You could probably best define common law as a body of law based on immemorial tradition, custom, and precedent, and the techniques for applying those traditions, customs, and precedents. Sometimes we use it more specifically to refer to the Anglo-Saxon common law of England and of North America. Let's get a few phases of history as we see how this law developed. And in this lecture, we'll be talking about the Celtic and Anglo-Saxon phases. In the next lecture, we'll be talking about the Norman phases and going up to the present time. 
The Celts arrived in the British Isles, some say around 700 BC. The date is uncertain. Some put it much earlier, some put it quite a bit later. They weren't the first people to live in the British Isles. There were at least two cultures that had preceded them, the Tuatha Dadaman for one and the Thinboga for another. The Celtic people were a class society, not a caste society. You could rise from one class or fall from one class, but they were a class society. And one class, the rulers and warriors, sometimes referred to in medieval thought throughout Europe as those who fight, that was their function. They were the black belts, they were the trained warriors. They knew how to use weapons and they knew how to rule. They were the highest caste, sometimes called the Ri. The next caste was the Druids. This was the intellectual caste. They included a number of different aspects. One was the priest Druids. And there's a lot of uncertainty about Druidic religion. Some believe that the Druids were a caste of priests very similar to the Magi that we read about in Persia and in other Middle Eastern places, being monotheistic or close to monotheistic, believing strongly in absolute standards of right and wrong, having strict moral principles by which they were governed. Others will say that the Druids weren't monotheistic at all, practiced human sacrifice to various pagan gods, and possibly the truth is somewhere in between. Another caste of Druids was the historians. Still another were the king's cabinet. His advisors were generally Druids. Another caste were the medics. Still another, the writers and scholars and bards, those who kept up the traditions by promoting culture in this way. And another caste was the lawyer caste, or as they're commonly called, the Brahan caste, the Brahan priests were the lawyers and judges of society. We have a little difficulty learning about Druidic law because very seldom was any of it reduced to writing. The Brahan priests insisted that writing retards the memory, and there's probably some truth in that. And they required, if you wanted to become a Brahan or a Druid lawyer, you had to study for 14 years. And again, the study consisted of learning at the feet of other Druids. It consisted of observing cases. The lawyer or judge class that we call the Brahans were a very respected class among the Druids. They didn't do so much litigation as much as they did trying to resolve disputes, much more arbitration and mediation than actual litigation. So we've seen these castes, the first ruler caste or class, and then the Druids with its various subclasses. And then we have the worker class that is just about everybody else. We see a similar division throughout much of Europe in class systems. The rulers and the warriors are called those who fight, the priests, are called those who pray, and everyone else is called those who work. One other interesting feature about the Dark Ages is that after the collapse of Greece and Rome, we find that slavery largely dies out as an institution, not entirely, but it largely dies out during the Dark Ages and is revived again during the so-called Enlightenment. Rome and Greece were both slave empires. In fact, in the height of its days of democracy, Athens had far more slaves than free people. Plato justified this with the idea that you need slavery for freedom to function. What he meant by this is that the various duties that a freeman has to serve in the city council, to serve on juries, to maybe be on the fire commission or the police commission or other things like this, he couldn't fulfill these functions unless he had slaves to run his household and his business. And so slaves were necessary for democracy in his view. In Aristotle's view, slavery was the natural order of things. That 
Only people who have the power of reason can function as free people. And that includes only free adult males. Reason, or Aristotle said, is absent in women. It is undeveloped in children and it is inoperative in slaves. And so, he said, slaves would be utterly miserable if they were free, and free men would be utterly miserable if they were slaves. This is the natural order. And I find it so interesting that modern liberals are so critical of the Confederacy and the American South because of its slavery, and yet they are enamored by Greece and Rome, which had a much stricter slave society than ever did the American South. When we look to Celtic law, one of the best ways of understanding it is to read a legal code that is known as the Sentius Moor. Now, as I mentioned, the Druidic law was largely unwritten. But you might remember the man that we call St. Patrick, or his Roman father would have called him Patricius. His English mother would have called him maybe just Patrick. But he was born in either North England or Scotland. And when he was a young man, he writes in his confessions that he had gotten a long way from the Lord. He was raised in a Christian home. But he was captured by pirates and taken to Ireland as a slave. And there he spent several years in Ireland and apparently became trusted and was guarding sheep and managed to escape that way, made his way across Ireland to the coast and get aboard a ship that was going to what we now call England, Britain in those days, landed and made his way up the coast to back home. But he had a tremendous love for the Irish people even though they had made him a slave. And he says that he had a vision one night. In that vision, Irish people were speaking to him and saying, come, holy boy, and walk among us once again. And he took this as a call to become a missionary to Ireland. He decided he needed some theological training first, and so he went to, in effect, seminary at that time, then came back to Ireland. First thing he did when he arrived in Ireland was go back to his master and pay him the cost of a slave. Not many slave runaways would feel a need to do that, but it certainly gave Patrick a great deal of credibility. And Patrick, through his long ministry in Ireland, largely Christianized Ireland, but also developed this legal document, the Sentius Moor. The High King of Ireland commissioned Patrick to prepare this code as head of a commission. And this commission was to consist of nine other people besides Patrick. Three of these were to be Christian bishops. Three of them were to be lesser kings or lords. And three of them were to be Druid priests. And so they drafted this code that is known as the Sentius Moor or the Great Tradition. And this code served as Ireland's legal code for about 1,200 years. Now, the introduction to the Sentius Moor says that it was then that all the professors of the sciences in Erin were assembled, and each of them exhibited his art before Patrick in the presence of every chief in Erin. Now, the judgments of true nature, which the Holy Ghost had spoken through the mouths of the Brahans, that is, the Druid lawyers, and the just poets of Erin, from their occupation of the island to the reception of the faith, were all exhibited by Dubtok, one of Patrick's earliest converts. What did not clash with the word of God in the written law and in the New Testament, and with the consciences of the believers, was confirmed in the laws of the Brahans by Patrick and by the ecclesiastics and the chieftains of Aaron. In other words, what he's saying, we took the Druid law, its oral tradition, and except where it conflicted with Scripture, Old and New Testament, or the consciences of Christians, we just made that the law of the Sentius Moor. 
And they go on to say, for the law of nature, that is the Druidic law, the law of nature had been quite right, except for the faith and its obligations, and this is the sensuous more. It is a lengthy code, but a code that contains very detailed procedural protections as well as abstract principles. Now, Patrick, besides the Sensus More, also composed and carried with him a small book called the Liber Ex Lega. Full title, Liber Ex Lega Moisai, that is the book of the laws of Moses, which contained the Ten Commandments and other portions of the Bible. And Patrick carried copies of this with him regularly as he traveled and gave those to the various Irish lords that he would encounter. Well, we have an interlude in the Celtic phase of British law. This is the Roman conquest of Britain about 43 AD. And Rome controls Britain up to Hadrian's Wall to the 400s AD, at which time the emperor withdraws the legions. The probable reason is that they had decided that Rome was overextended. It wasn't as strong as it used to be. It couldn't maintain this far-flung empire anymore. And we now need these legions back closer to Rome itself. And so in the 400s, the legions are withdrawn. As a result, the protection that the Britons, the Celtic people on the island of Britain, had enjoyed from the Irish and the Scots and the Picts and the Welsh, that protection is no longer there. And so there is something of an interlude at this time in which we have some confusion and anarchy. Rome had governed Britain by this time for nearly 500 years. During this time, they ruled presumably according to Roman law. When they left, we don't really know how much they actually left an influence behind. It used to be thought that when Rome left, they left suddenly and left very little trace that they had ever been there and that their influence on the island was virtually nil. The view is moving more toward the idea that they may have had a greater lasting influence on British law than had been previously thought. We know also that during this period, Christianity had entered Britain. Tertullian, a church father and lawyer from North Africa who lived from 155 to 222 AD, speaks about the expansion of Christianity. And in this case, writing around 200 BC, he says that Christianity has expanded to include all the limits of the Spains and of the diverse nations of the Gauls, that is France, and in the haunts of Britain, inaccessible to the Romans, but subjugated to Christ. In other words, even areas of the British Isles that Rome had never been able to reach, Christianity had spread. At least by 200 AD, Christianity was present in the British Isles, and some believe it goes much, much further back than that, and there is some evidence to that effect. After the legions leave the British Isles, we move into the second part of the Celtic phase of English legal history. This would be the age of King Arthur, and as to whether Arthur is a true historical figure, there has always been debate. I think the evidence is moving more toward the view that Arthur himself was a real figure, but that many of the King Arthur stories are taken from other romances of the medieval period and that a lot of those have been added to Arthur without a basis in reality. But during this period of time, the Celtic Britons were suffering invasions and raids by the Picts and the Scots to the north and by the Irish to the west. And so they looked for help from the continent. And in the late 400s to early 500s, three tribes from the areas of northern Germany and Denmark come, the Angles and the Saxons of northern Germany, 
and the Jutes from Denmark, and they enter England at this time. They claim in their history that they were asked by the Britons to come in and defend them against the Scots and the Picts. Some question whether that was their real reason for coming, but at any rate, they did overcome the Scots and the Picts, but they looked at this island then and they said, this is a beautiful place, we're staying. And they took over, and as a result, what was Britain became known as Angle Land or England and remains by that name today. The Celtic people were kind of banished up into Scotland and Ireland and Wales. Many did still live within Anglo-Saxon England and the cultures certainly merged to a great extent and sometimes by the days of King Alfred English culture is described as Anglo-Celtic. Anglo in its legal forms of organization, Celtic in its culture. But this is the controlling power in England then until 1066 AD. And when the Angles and the Saxons and the Jutes came, they brought with them their system of Teutonic or Anglo-Saxon common law. Remember, they had continued this system, whereas the Teutonic or Germanic people to the south of them had adopted more centralized Roman forms. At first, when the Anglo-Saxons came, they were nearly all, if not entirely, pagan, but they gradually embraced Christianity. Undoubtedly, many were influenced by Celtic Christianity, but as the Catholic Church sent the missionary Augustine, not the same as Augustine of Hippo, this is another, 200 years later, in 597, he is successful in converting King Athelbert of the Anglo-Saxons to Christianity, and Christianity soon becomes the dominant religion of Angle land. They governed Angle land with a highly decentralized government, they divided England into a heptarchy, or that is, a nation of seven kingdoms, East Anglia, which was Angle, Essex, which is East Saxony, Kent, which was the Jutes kingdom in Southeast England, Mercia, which was another Angle kingdom, Northumbria, which was also the Angles, and then Sussex, or South Saxony, and Wessex, or West Saxony. These were the seven sub-kingdoms of England. These kingdoms themselves were very much decentralized, and the centralization system is exactly that which we found Jethro giving to Moses back there in the book of Exodus. The head of each ten families was called a tithing man, or tenth man. The head of each fifty families was called a bell man, or village man, the head of each hundred families was called a hundred man. The head of each thousand families was called an elder man, or shortened to Earl, or Norse, Jarl. The territory occupied by approximately a thousand families was called a shire. The Earl is the presiding chieftain of the shire, and the Earl's assistant was called the reef. The shire reef. Say that a few times and you get sheriff. And that's where we get our name sheriff. Each shire had a court and the judge of each shire court was usually a bishop. Each kingdom was governed by a king and by a council that consisted of the earls and the shires and other leaders within that particular kingdom. And that council that governed was known as the witton or biton. When the kingdoms met together, and these Witons from the seven kingdoms met together, they were called the Great Council or the Witton Gemot. Anglo-Saxon law practiced trial by jury, not in the Greek sense, but in the sense that it originated in Germany or Scandinavia. The Witton, the governing body, was also the jury that tried cases. They tried cases in deciding law as well as deciding fact. 
Those who served were often added to the witan, or the jury in this case, because they might have some information about the case. If you saw it happen, you might be asked to serve as a juror. Very much the opposite of today, where if you know anything about the case, you're not supposed to be serving on the jury. Alfred the Great lived from 849 to 900 AD, was a devoted Christian, capable ruler, the only king in English history to be called the Great, although some call Canute, Canute the Great. He was also a committed scholar who attracted to his court scholars from England, from Ireland, from France, and from Germany. He himself personally translated into the Anglo-Saxon tongue Pope Gregory's pastoral care, Boethius' consolation of philosophy, Augustine's soliloquies, Bede's ecclesiastical history, and Aracelus' history against the pagans. He required his elder men and Shire Reeves to read these works. Possibly he is best known for his work that is known as the Book of Dooms, or Book of Judgments, or Laws. In an 1832 translation by a royal commission in England, we see the beginning of this Book of Dooms. The Lord spake these words to Moses, and thus said, I am the Lord thy God. I led thee out of the land of the Egyptians and of their bondage. Love thou not other strange gods above me. Utter thou not my name idly, for thou shalt not be guiltless toward me if thou utter my name idly. Remember that thou hallow the rest day. Honor thy father and thy mother. Slay thou not. Commit thou not adultery, steal thou not, say thou not false witness, covet thou not thy neighbor's goods unjustly, make not to thyself golden or silver gods. Well, Alfred had another problem on his hands, and that was Viking raids. The Viking raids had begun during this era, and they came to control a good portion of Scotland and a good portion of northern England as well. And they had a system of law very much like the Anglo-Saxons had had, if anything, even more decentralized and individualistic than the other. Al Alfred battled against them, finally forced them to agree to a treaty where a line was drawn across England. That line was, north, was known as the Dane law. North of that line, Viking law would govern. South of that law, Anglo-Saxon law would govern, and one condition of the treaty that Alfred insisted upon was that the Norse king had to become a Christian, and he agreed to do so. There's fair element or evidence of Celtic Christianity having reached Norway centuries before Norway was actually converted in the reigns of King Olaf Tryggvason and King Olaf, or King Olaf Haraldsson, and that the Viking raids may have been a reaction against Charlemagne and his raids upon the Anglo-Saxons. But Viking law did become quite well entrenched in some of the northern parts of England. Like Anglo-Saxon law, it emphasized decentralized government. Each community was governed by a jarl or earl, and the town council was called a thing, and the combined kingdom was had a governing body known as the All Thing. They functioned not only as a governing legislating council, but also as jurors. But eventually, as the kingdoms grew, the juries became separate from the thing. Each community had a man who was called a goatee, or that is, a judge or law speaker. He was elected by the free men of the community for a three-year term. And at each annual meeting, meeting of the thing, the Godi was required to recite from memory at least one-third of the Viking law, so that after a three-year period, he'd apparently cover the whole thing, and they'd remember from each time to time, and that was their reminder. The thing had the authority to enter a finding of guilt or innocence, but if they found someone guilty, they had no authority to impose punishment. And so what they would do if they found someone guilty 
was to declare that person outside the protection of the law, or in other words, an outlaw, meaning that anyone can legally kill him. And so the actual vengeance then was left under the kinsman of the victim. Well, this proved to be quite a problem. If you read through Njal saga and a lot of the old Viking sagas, you will see where there are lengthy feuds that take place over generations. And obviously, the defendant probably has some kinsmen that don't think the verdict was right or think that he was justified in what he did. And so the conflict perpetuates. So eventually, they come to the point that they decide that the thing has to have the authority to impose punishment. We just can't leave that up to private citizens. Anglo-Saxon law and Viking law would differ in several respects. First of all, there are some core values in Viking law, and those would be courage, keeping one's oath, loyalty to kinsmen, and a duty to avenge kinsmen. And in their view, vengeance equaled justice. Viking law differed from Anglo-Saxon law, though, in that Oral agreements in Viking law are every bit as binding as written agreements. The thing could meet on the call of any freeman at any time. Freeholders of land had more independence the, than they did in Germany, and that may be due in part to the geography in Norway. And there was more of a difference in the amount that you had to pay as a fine for having killed somebody between a noble versus a peasant. See, in Viking law and Druidic law was much the same in this too. It was a much more serious offense to kill a Jarl or a nobleman than it was to kill a peasant. But at the same time, the Jarl or nobleman is held to a higher standard and he has to pay a much higher fine or virgild as it was called, the fine. He has to make a much higher virgil payment than would a peasant who had committed the same crime. Those to whom much is given, from them much is expected. As we look then, we can see that Anglo-Saxon law, Celtic law, and Viking law combine with concepts of the Jewish law and the canon law to form this common law of England, all of which brings us up to the year 1066, another very decisive battle, and big changes in store for the English common law.